Hello and welcome back to Guillotined 18th Century Counts Theatre. Today we are going to go into a little bit more detail in Lewis Dots, talk about some of the advanced rules, um, talk about maybe a few things that we glossed over in the first lesson, just to get started. But we're going to look at uh, dealing with uneven number of electrons, and to do that we'll have to talk about formal charge. And then we're going to talk about resonance structures and polyatomics, which again we've touched on before a little bit. So, our friends are back. And so the first problem we're going to run into is an odd number of electrons, uh, valence electrons specifically. If this happens, go back and check your addition first. Probably you added something up wrong. But if you end up with an odd number of electrons, we can deal with it. Uh, it's not uh, a nice thing to deal with, uh, but we can handle this. Um, things with an unpaired electron are known as radicals, formerly free radicals sort of a dangling covalent bond ready to react with stuff. And most of these are highly reactive. It's one of the things that tore up the ozone uh, layer, for instance, or is the idea of these radicals. Um, often in biology, they're uh, attached to theories of aging um, in the body. Anyway, these are allowed, uh, and, uh, and you will often break the octet rule. Uh, and, and there are other times to do that too. We might not get into it at this level though. And again, these are unstable structures, but they can exist. And so one of the things we need to do to figure out the best possible structure uh, when dealing with where to put an unshared electron is to look at something called formal charge. Um, formal charge, don't confuse this with oxidation states. Um, oxidation states was sort of a winner-take-all idea that we used um, when we were figuring out um, what the charge would be for a of covalently bonded atom. Uh, but in this case, we're actually doing just the opposite. Uh, formal charge is really just splitting the difference, and you're going to give an electron to each atom. So to figure out someone's formal charge, you simply figure out how many valence electrons they start with based on location on the periodic table. And then you subtract out uh, any unshared electrons. And then you subtract one electron for each bond it's making, because we'll assume that it gets half of the electrons involved. And what you want to do is find the structure that gives you the lowest possible uh, formal charge. Um, zeros uh, all the way down would be excellent. If there's a, a more than one choice, go for the choice that makes the least number of bonds. Now again, this really is only relevant to um, dealing with lone electrons. You could feel free to draw it, or I mean to figure out formal charges of other structures too, but it's going to match up with what we already talked about in the idea of uh, the families making certain numbers of bonds preferentially, like halogens only making one, calcogens making two, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But they should match up with formal charge stuff. Remember, this won't supersede, though, the idea of uh, the octet rule. Uh, lone electrons are sort of an exception to this. They're going to break the rules, but um, other than that, you want to make sure that you're trying to get that full eight. So let's look at NO2, something that's going to give us an odd number of electrons. Um, so go ahead and try to draw a couple structures for NO2. I actually came up with uh, four or uh, you know, maybe more, depending on how you look at it. Hey, welcome back. Um, so uh, here's the structures I came up with. Uh, e each one of these is a little different. Uh, notice that uh, depending on the one has two double bonds, the rest of them have one double bond, one single bond, and then we either have the unshared electron on nitrogen or oxygen. Um, so let's see what we can do here. And so what we can do is we can figure out all the formal charges here. Uh, you'll notice in the top left one, uh, you've got um, two bonding electrons and then three uh, unbonding electrons, so that's going to give you a uh, a 6 and 5, so a plus 1. The nitrogen in the middle is going to be 0 because you've got 3 bonding and 2 non-bonding. And then the one on the right has got 6 non-bonding and 1 bonding. So that gives you a negative 1. It's 1 over it started with. And then you do the same thing. You work your way through. Um, the bottom ones uh, are better because you end up with 0 formal charges on each of the atoms. Uh, 6, 5, 6 across in both situations, which is nice. But one of the bottom is preferential to the other because the um, one on the left only makes uh, three bonds as opposed to the one on the right that's making four bonds. So that's how you can figure out that's the preferential structure there. And again, that's a lot of work, um, but you don't run into odd numbers of electrons very often. 
Now, you might have, uh, for that bottom one, you could have drawn it a different way. You, you could have put the double bond on the other side, and everything else would have been the same. And that's the same thing we run into if you draw it for ozone. So, again, draw ozone. I'll wait for you. Hey, welcome back. Um, so you could have put the double bond on the left or the double bond on the right. Now, don't be tempted to draw a little triangle. Um, cyclical structures do exist, but not, not typically at a, in a, in a three-member ring. Uh, the, the smallest you typically see are five or more commonly six member rings. So don't try to cram this into a little triangle. Now this isn't exactly the same thing because each of those oxygens could be uh, unique. Um, if you went one, two, three, then you could have a bond between one and two or a bond between two and three. And that might not necessarily be the same thing. Again, just think of the idea of you um, standing next to somebody you like and them standing next to somebody they like. <laughs> it's a big difference whether the person's holding your hand or that other person's hand. So people are not interchangeable. Atoms are not necessarily interchangeable. And so you might have more than one possible structure. And again, each of these would have the same formal charge, so you couldn't use that to narrow it down. So which one exists? It actually ends up being neither and both of them at the same time. Um, if these were actually a single or double bond, then, then uh, measurements would predict that the double bond would be shorter than the, than the uh, single bond. And it turns out that all the bonds are actually the same length, and, and some and length is somewhere in between a single and a double bond. And those are called resonance structures, where you have two potentially equal Lewis dot structures, um, where it really just involves moving double bonds around, typically. Um, and so the way we represent that, because we're not incredibly artistic people sometimes, is instead of trying to draw that uh, double bond blurring over the two possible places, which is technically what happens, we draw an arrow in between. Please, that does not mean that it's flipping back and forth. It means the actual structure is somewhere in between those structures. So keep an eye out for resonance structures because um, if you don't identify them uh, on your own, you could lose points. Notice that NO2 that we drew before, again, has a resonance structure. Resonance structures tend to add a little stability to the system, and you'll learn more about that later. Um, but, but a resonance structure is a good thing, so be happy when you can draw one of those. And you'll often see re resonance structures in polyatomics. Now, polyatomics, for long-time viewers, uh, you will know that we have talked about polyatomics before. Polyatomics are really covalently bonded atoms that as a whole have decided to gain or lose electrons to make it work. And so you draw them just like any other Lewis dot structure, uh, but now you have to account for charge. Um, and it's very easy to do. Uh, if it's got a negative charge, just throw in some extra electrons. And if it's got a positive charge, take some electrons away. And, uh, and then when you're all done, you just put the whole thing in brackets um, and then indicate the charge on the outside. So it's very, very easy to do. They're a lot of fun. Just don't forget the brackets and the charge. And so we could do ammonium, for instance. Um, so I'll, I'll wait for you. Go ahead and see what you can do with ammonium, NH4+. Hey, hey, you're back. And so what you would do, again, you don't have a lot of choices there. Nitrogen's going to have to go in the middle. And then you put the hydrogens on the outside. Um, so you'll see that that ends up, uh, to, to make that work, though, um, to get nitrogen to a full outer shell of eight, it had to lose one electron. And rather than have that electron on there somewhere, it gets rid of it. And that's how you get a that's how you get a polyatomic. Now typically they're going to be gaining electrons, not losing electrons. Um, but it still works out. So a little motivational dialogue before we sign off today. And we haven't seen the last of Lewis Dot. What we're going to do in the next lesson is actually use Lewis Dot and uh, inflate them <laughs> and make them into 3D structures. And, uh, and then once we get the 3D structures, we'll go back tied in electronegativity, and then we can talk about intermolecular forces. So good times, good times await us. So that's all for today. Um, you know, covered a lot of the advanced rules. Again, use the ones that you want to use. Um, I can understand how that might get a little overwhelming, but just keep practicing on the basic level and you'll be fine. All right, thanks for watching and have a great day.